Okay guys, so in this video we are going to walk through server-side rendered React. So let's get into it. So first and foremost what we're going to cover is that we are going to check I'm basically going to try to explain to you what it is and how it works and then we're going to look at some of the benefits and some of the drawbacks and some alternatives that you should consider. So server-side rendering React is basically the idea that you have a, because if you have worked with SBA frameworks you will know that you have a some type of HTML file that you send to the client and um, which includes your JavaScript and then it basically just loads your JavaScript onto the page and that renders out the like the view for the user right but when you're using server-side rendered react basically what you're doing is that you are pre-rendering the initial thing that the user sees when the page loads and that allows the user to get the sensation that, oh, this happened instantaneously. There's not that little moment of flicker. Now that flickering is due to, if you've seen it before, that is due to the pay browser loading the web page first. And without server-side rendering things, it's basically going to make that document available first, and then it's going to load in the JavaScript. And when the JavaScript is loaded, then JavaScript or React in this case kicks in and it basically shows the view right. But there's a delay between that, and that's what server-side rend server rendering is going to help you with, among SEO value and a few other things. But th those are more advanced topics that we can cover in, a, in some other video. So basically server-side rendering things is actually the way that things used to work. It's just that SBA applications have made it popular to do things in another manner. So if you know how to make traditional web pages, you should feel fairly comfortable with the concept of server-side rendering. So there are benefits to doing server-side rendering, but I also want to touch on some of the drawbacks that can come with using this approach because it's actually not something that you should just use for every project. So let's have a but let's first illustrate things a little bit. So I have this amazing application here. You can see here where we can go to the project inside and like uh, just click around with a few links, right? Like this, a super amazing application, right? So when I refresh this page, you can see here that there is no flicker. However, when I click here, if I don't know if you can actually see that, but there's a slight flicker that occurs. A way that I can illustrate this to be a little bit more clear is to go to the specific endpoint here where you can see that, hey, it first says undefined and then it says home. And basically what's happening here is that this is the traditional way a SBA application works. So basically what's going to happen is that the page is going to load and then the JavaScript is going to get uh, fetched from the network and then it's going to overwrite or add in the element, uh, like the DOM tree basically. So if we look at the initial request here, we'll see that the preview of this is just undefined and will like it's just not rendering in anything. And you see that I have my, my root element here, which is just the B, you know, the root element of which is very common in React land where you basically bootstrap your entire application and I'm just putting undefined in there. And so what basically happens here now is that the content is go of this element is going to get replaced by the JavaScript when that is loaded. And that's why you see the flicker, because the page loads into memory and then it gets the JavaScript and then the view actually gets rendered right. But that is not happening here. This is instantaneous, as you can see. And the reason behind that is because if we look at the preview here, I'm actually sending the document exactly as you see it. So if we now look at the response, we'll see that the root element actually has a bunch of markup inside of it. And this is the server-side rendered part. So <clears throat> let's walk through the code here to kind of just touch on these concepts. So first and foremost, here is our Webpack configuration. <clears throat> so one of the first things that you should consider when you're using server-side rendering is that it's very likely you're basically going to have to accommodate two different sets of bundles. Now I'm using Webpack for this, but basically the, the minimum requirement is that you use something like Babel Loader and that it shouldn't be much more than that basically. And the reason why we need to have two bundles is because now that we are using server-side rendered React, we're actually going to have to include JSX into our server. Now, basically what that means is that we're going to compile our server alongside with our actual 
with our JavaScript, and that's something you should be aware of. That you might actually have to do this. There might be another way of doing it, but I'm actually I'm not aware of a, of another method of doing this at this time. But basically, that means that the server needs to be included here. You can see I have my little configurations here. You can see that I'm actually grabbing the server itself, this server file, which is the entry to my application here. Uh, if we open this here, we'll see that this is actually, oh, this is all the server code that is actually serving up my content. And the bundle.server file, that's actually the output of bundle, which is going to be able to handle the router and all of this good stuff here. So this is a very, it's a fairly common thing that you see when people are doing server-side rendering. So what now happens is that, that that's something we should have with us as a possible drawback because now we are mixing in unsupported JavaScript. J JSX is not supported as just native JavaScript, which means that we need some type of way of transpiling this if we don't want to just exclude. It's, pop, it's pretty much... I'm going to say that it's po probably possible to do this without JSX as well, but this is a common thing that you will see. It's not so common that people don't use JSX even for the server-side rendering. So keep that with you. Now this server needs to actually be transpiled. So if we look at our application here, we see that I am including a bunch of stuff here, and I'm, this is just a basic express server. We're going to walk through it. So when my application actually loads, we see I have my classic API endpoints here where I can get some products and I can get a specific product, which is exactly what you're seeing here. So when I do the network request here, you can see that I can click here and we can see that I'm going to the network and I'm grabbing my products on this endpoint here. And if I refresh this page and I go and I click home, you will see that I actually go to the product endpoint here and then I'm going to get all the products. Easy PC. So these two endpoints here. Now these are the server-side rendered endpoints where basically now what I should be aware of, which is something that I need to account for, is that I need to have a mirror set of endpoints between my React router, well, my router on the client side, and the endpoints on my server. In other words, I need to make sure that there is one handler for each of the cases of the pages that I actually want to load. And that's a small drawback there as well, because what now happens is that I have two sources of truth. In other words, this, these endpoints here, who are giving me my data when my client, like when the page has actually loaded, I need to make sure that these are in sync. The data that they, these are producing are going to be in sync with these endpoints. Now, because you can see here, because I need to get my products, I need to create an initial state of some sort unless I want to go to the network. I mean, I can also, of course, I can server-side rendered without actually having any data in my project, in my in my markup, but then it kind of nullifies a bit of the value in this. It's a way off that you can make yourself if you prefer to have just partially rendered content on your page or if you want to render, render all of it. But basically it's something you should keep with you that now I need to sync this endpoint and this endpoint to make sure that any update I make to my APIs also happen here. So you now need to consider both the initial state, the actual first rendered state, and the state, the end state that is going to be the thing that the user sees once the JavaScript has loaded. Because if there's a mismatch between these two, the page will look different. It will start out looking one way with one state, and as soon as the JavaScript kicks in, it might actually end up in a completely different state. So you need to think about that. You have Instead of having one state and one source of truth, you now have two. So these need to be in sync. And then apart from that, uh, we're going to render out our static markup, our little router here, and then we're going to pass it into my little HTML function here, which is just a little function that basically all it does is that it takes in the JSX and some state or a default state, and it renders out an HTML page with just plain old text here. This is the thing that you saw earlier when we were actually sending it over the network. And then you might ask why I'm doing this. And basically what I'm doing is that I am grabbing the initial state and put the, rendering the string, like that content string, into this window object. And I can show you actually how that looks if we just go to, uh, if we go to, uh, we refresh this. 
and we look at the response, you can see here that my window state, the initial state, is this outrendered JavaScript here. And basically why I'm doing this is that it is allow this allows me to actually grab the initial state from well, from the page so I can actually show it in my uh, JavaScript immediately when the page is actually loaded, right? So let's see here. Apart from that, this is pretty much, uh, well, yeah, and pretty much the, the same structure as rendering any page. You just do you do this pre-rendering pre step and then you send the outputted string. It's not all that, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing as a standard web application. And then we have our catch-all down here, which basically does a very similar thing to these uh, to these endpoints. It's just that in this case, there is no initial state. Like we don't have handlers for this, so we will just render out what we can and send that to the client. And this basically behaves the same way as a standard SPA application. As you saw this test endpoint here, it doesn't actually do any pre-rendering. It's just going to send the document an empty HTML document, then this is going to behave the same way as if it's a standard non-server-side rendered React application. So we have two things that we need to consider now. Let's actually look a bit at the public stuff. So here we have our entry point into our React application. And basically all it's, as you can see here, it's just going to grab this internal, this client router and it's going to grab the state on the window when this actually straps to the, to the page so that we don't actually have to go to the network to fetch like the following like the fetch the information now this is a personal preference i have but you can do it in in other ways if you want to let's look at the components and in my app component we have three different application components and we have our server router which is this thing that we actually server side render this application state or well this component here and then we have our client router which is the thing that is actually going to be used on the client itself so we make a distinction between the like a react router that is going to be used on in the client and on the server and then we have our application, which is a very small little application where basically we just do our component includes here. We create an initial state so that if there is no state, we actually have something. And here are our routes. And basically all they are going to do is that, yeah, they're going to render out these components and yeah, not, nothing super fancy there. And then we have our header component. I can just walk through them. They, these are not super interesting. The header and the footer are like super, super small little components here. And then we have the more interesting components, which is the product page and the home page. So let's look at the home page. So this is the main application component. Like when you were refreshing, this is what you're going to see. And this is something that I really I kind of like with server-side rendering, apart from the other benefits that I've talked about, and that is that although it adds a bit of more complexity with your project, it allows you to also kind of think about performance, where you can actually conditionally go to the network. I mean, as you may have noticed, when I refresh this page, there is no network request for products. I can actually do that. But if I go to this page, there is a network request. I refresh this page. You will notice that there is no network request for this uh, for this page anymore. I'm not actually going and grabbing that product. However, if I go back, you see that the network request for products is actually fired, and that comes down to the initial state. So I can, because I'm server side rendering the information on the page, I no longer have to just blindly go to the network again to get the same information when the JavaScript loads. I can actually decide to check. Okay. Do I already have this information now in my my server-side rendered state? Because if I do, then I can just ignore the network request. And that's I think is pretty cool all in all. It's a small little like gold nugget or like a small small thing that I kind of enjoy. And here is my top product which is just going to be these links here. So the component itself is fairly small. And then we can have our product component, which is also pretty, it's very similar. And this this component did mount structure here, as you, we, I touched on earlier. Basically, what I'm going to check here is if the product that I am passing into this component, if it matches the product ID in the URL, like this thing here, or if it doesn't match, I'm actually going to go to the network 
but if it like uh, if it does match, it's not going to get it. As you saw here, like in, I I'm going to the network for a new component. I refresh this. There is no network request. But if I go to another product, there is actually going to be a network request because now I don't have this in the state anymore. So these are the, some of the things that. Uh, you, I think are relevant when you do server-side render in React. So the main thing that I see as like there, there are a lot of benefits to this but it also introduces a bit of complexity so I urge you to really think about whether or not this extra layer of complexity is worth it for the benefits that it brings versus doing something different. Now a different approach of doing this uh, if you're unless you're thinking about the like this like the SEO value of your application then it might be a different story but if your your main concern is to provide a good user experience this is one way of approaching it another way of approaching it is the classic way where you, everything is client side and you use something like a loading screen or something like that that works as well it doesn't work for the initial render but there is an th approach that I kind of like myself to, to do for this and um, if I'll just show you that so I go to home you saw that little flicker there let's actually slow that down a little bit let's do that on a slower connection so here we are now on a slow connection and basically what we're doing now is that we are showing a, a basically just content placeholder material to the user. Now this approach gives us the ability to basically keep the benefits of having a client side, an like all client side loaded React application but still provide a decent loading experience to the user so that the user has something to look at or some sensation of progression when the page actually initially loads and the way that this is done is very simple it basically comes down to having a static file in this case I've just hard-coded these files you can make a nicer implementation of this but all it is is that I have the like the actual markup of the page rough like a rough shape of what the page is going to look like and then I put some basic CSS styles on top of it so that you actually get like you don't have to do it like this it's just the way that I like it like there's some type of loading indicator or something pulsating or something basically just showing an outline or a wireframe if you will of how the page is going to look when it's done loading and what's nice about this is that it's a little bit less maintenance because the biggest drawback as I want to re re reiterate here is this thing here where when you have when you're using server-side rendered react the biggest thing that may or may not mess you up is that you have two sources of data where you need to keep the server-side state in sync with the client-side state and it may not be a problem it might be a problem but it's something that you should be aware of so hopefully I've shown you a few concepts and kind of that are useful to think about when you're using server-side rendered react and I hope you have a great day